Here's my basic methodology for reverse engineering and patching abandonware using entirely free utilities. This is a condensed visual summary of my in-depth blog article on the same topic, so if you want all of the exhausting details, please check that out as well. A friend approached me with an obscure Roman coin cataloging program from the 90s called Monita. The business vanished many years ago, making it impossible to acquire the unique hardware-based activation codes. After 11 launches, the app kicks the user out, rendering it useless to the customers who paid 100 bucks each. In addition, it was never developed for modern 64-bit operating systems, so cannot even be installed these days. I'll fix all of that up and more in a nine-phase process that should be applicable to a large range of old and unsupported software. Phase 1. Imaging the Original Media before beginning any investigative review of software, I always make a digital image of the original media for safekeeping and for quick access to the vanilla source files. The CD I was given was for Monita 1.2, so I'll begin by making an image of that. For most software CDs, the free disk burning and ripping tool ImageBurn works great. After the ISO is created, we can mount the image and browse its contents as if it were a CD. Since the original Monita disk was self-burned by the developer, there was nothing remarkable about it and we could have alternatively just copied the files from the disk into the new directory. That said, the final version of the software released was version 2.0.15a and I always prefer to start with the last available version for maximum feature inclusion. With thanks to several generous members of the Forum Ancient Coins website, who were equally interested in my offer to patch the software, I was able to eventually acquire the contents of a 2.0 CD along with the final update ever released. I went ahead and created a second ISO from these files so that I have a pristine digital copy of both version 1 and version 2. From there, I mounted the V2 disk image and copied the files over to a new vanilla directory on my computer. In order to retain the source contents for future reference, I made one final copy of this folder and called it Working, which will be where I make modifications. Phase 2. Assessing the Installer The Monita Installer won't even launch on modern operating systems, so a logical first step investigation is to determine what installer was used and how we can get at the packaged files. The easiest way to find this out is by checking the installer's metadata from the executable's properties. Right away, it is obvious that the program was packaged using Install Shield 3 circa 1999. Other ways to tell would be by inspecting the accompanying setup files. For instance, underscore inst32i.ex underscore is immediately identifiable as an install shield installer archive as any cursory search online would confirm. Installer variants can also be determined by looking for clues within the setup wizard itself, or often by scanning the installer with the free Universal Extractor tool that uses numerous utilities and techniques to pinpoint the installer and can even extract the contents from many of them. Install Shield 3.0 was from an era when 16-bit and 32-bit operating systems coexisted and 64-bit systems were still a future marvel. For maximum compatibility back then, the installer used a 16-bit installer stub that itself would extract and launch either a 16-bit or 32-bit installer, depending on the circumstances. The 32-bit installer remains compatible with 64-bit operating systems and is possible to extract from a compatible OS for use on 64-bit operating systems. To make life easier, ToastyTech.com has the 32-bit installer available for download, which saves the manual extraction process. With the new executable in place, the installer will open up on any modern PC, but may still take a while. Phase 3. Auditing System Changes Installers can make many invisible changes to the operating system, including registry edits, localized program files, and system-wide components. Knowing exactly what the original application alters can greatly streamline our investigative analysis while ensuring no changes go unnoticed. The most comprehensive way to capture every change an installer makes is by doing a full system audit before and after running it. The freeware portable utility What Changed is perfect for the job. To keep things clean and efficient, I prefer to use a fresh Windows install on a virtual machine using software such as VirtualBox to reduce the number of files that have to be indexed. With the working Monita installer copied over, I first run what changed and do a deep audit of existing files and registry entries. Then, I launch the Monita installer and run through the complete installation. Finally, I run what changed a second time to compare the differences. 
The end result shows that along with program-specific files being installed as expected, the installer also integrates Borland database engine components in several custom fonts within the system directory. The registry changes relate predominantly to BDE. This process has revealed the underlying database platform that Monita uses, which may be helpful as part of the modernization effort. The list of changed files and registry entries can be kept in a safe location and referred to regularly throughout the process, especially when reworking the installer later on. Phase 4. Probing the underlying software architecture. Applications are developed using a wide array of development frameworks, and knowing which one was used can sometimes assist with the reverse engineering process. A long-standing favorite for executable identification is PEID, which relies on digital signatures to determine the underlying architecture. By loading in an external signature file, more than 4,400 types of executables can easily be identified. When I import the Monita application, it immediately detects it as a Delphi version 6-7 executable. This knowledge, combined with our previous review of the installed files, including Borland Database Engine, gives enough solid insight to dive into the patchwork. Phase 5. Determining the License Validation Method Before we can patch the software, we need to determine the underlying mechanism that manages the validation functionality. Like most aspects of engineering, there are many approaches toward the final goal. A quick fix would be to alter the launch limit to something astronomically high so that it never runs out, while a more elegant solution is to patch the executable's original byte code to circumvent the entire activation process forever. We know that Monita keeps track of launch counts somewhere on the system, and when that count reaches 11, the trial application will kick the user out. The same auditing approach described previously can be rerun to compare two launch cycles to easily locate any modified files. This will offer clues as to where the launch count variable might be hidden. After review, I confirmed that the attribute.db file contains the magic value. In early versions of Monita, these Paradox database files are protected by a simple password. Even without knowing it directly, Paradox has a few catch-all passwords that can let anyone in. Not exactly a secured platform in the 1990s. By editing the value of AT10 in Paradox Data Editor to a much higher number and then resaving the database, the trial limit of the software is suddenly good for a million launches instead of just 11. Even so, the prompts and alerts can still be a nuisance, and later versions of Monita were double encrypted by a second master password and PX3P. A cleaner but more complex technique is to alter the executable itself so that it believes it's been registered, thus skipping all of the prompts entirely. While we could spend a lot of time deciphering the licensing and registration algorithms to produce a key generator of sorts, that is entirely unnecessary when our only interest is to produce a final working copy of an abandoned product. It is evident that the base activation key is hardware-derived, meaning it changes on every device it is installed to. This is why the developer required users to contact him directly with the validation code each time they install it to get a new license. The true logic flow of this validator will be confirmed in the next phase, but based on the prompts and functionality, a simplified flowchart probably looks something like this. The user launches the application. Monita generates a validation number based on the device's digital fingerprint. It then compares this number to any stored authorization code using a particular key algorithm. If the code comparison matches, the main program form launches. If the code comparison fails, it jumps to the trial check. In the trial check, if the number of times the program has launched is less than 11, it lets the user proceed. Otherwise, it kicks them out unless they enter the correct authorization code. Phase 6. Patching the executable With the overhead and preliminary discovery out of the way, we can work to patch the actual executable to circumvent the trial check. Computer files are fundamentally based on binary code, often represented as byte hex values for readability. If we know the underlying CPU architecture, such as x86, it becomes possible to disassemble the executable back into more human-readable assembly code by translating hex into opcodes. Using specialized tools that automate this disassembly, we can then target particular bytes, alter them as needed, and reassemble the modified executable. You can find quite a few free disassemblers and hex editors by searching online.
For a no-thrills hex editor to peek into the bytes and decoded text of an executable, I recommend HXD. But for complete disassembly and a serious study of an executable's underlying code structure, which we'll need for this project, nothing tops IDA, the interactive disassembler. IDA is free for personal use and can disassemble, debug, and reassemble 32-bit and 64-bit executables and runs on modern operating systems. When you first launch IDA, the Quick Start Wizard will let you create a new disassembly in a few clicks. For this exercise, we will click New and then browse to the vanilla Monita 2 executable from the original installation. The program will auto-detect the typical settings and upon clicking OK, will parse through the code, disassemble it, and create various other tab-accessible views for our benefit. GraphView offers a visual flowchart of how the various sections of code interact in assembly language. HexView shows the raw bytes as described previously, and by default will synchronize with GraphView. It could take hours to manually parse through the machine code to find what we are looking for. As a shortcut, we can quickly jump to the trial authentication section by searching one of the known alert strings while in graph or assembly view, such as, you can only start Monita. After a minute, four results are found. The first two results are from a function where the authentication calls are executed. The other two are locations in memory where the text strings are stored. Double-clicking a function match will jump to that section of assembly. We can toggle between assembly view and graph view by pressing the space key. With the graph view now zeroed in on the trial-related methods, we can get a more direct sense of the relevant routines. The giant blue block of conditionals all filter into a block of code relating to the hardware-derived authorization code. Analyzing this finds the use of file API components, such as the hard drive serial number, path, and volume name. These calls, as implemented, will actually fail on a modern operating system if not in XP compatibility mode and will lock up the application, which is another reason they have to go. If we zoom around using Control plus mouse wheel, we will find a small block of code above it that checks whether a certain D-word value, presumed to be the previously entered and validated license code, exists and then branches accordingly. Tracing the green path reveals it skips right past all of the authentication checking and directly to the final few routines to launch the main window, exactly what we want to do. We can evaluate this flow in real time by pressing F2 to set a breakpoint in the middle of the base routine, then F9 to start the debugger. This will launch the executable until it hits the breakpoint. From there, we can press F7 to step into routines, or F8 to proceed to the next line. When we reach the jump if not zero branching logic, the flashing red path indicates that, by default, we'll be sent through all of the validation checks since no license exists. To divert the flow to the green path, the simplest solution is to reverse the assembly code to a jump if zero instruction set. To do this, restart the debugger by pressing Ctrl F2 and then F9. When the breakpoint is reached, re-enable hex view synchronization using the right-click context menu. Now, clicking any assembly code will jump to that location in hex. The opcode for JNZ is 0F85, while the one for JZ is 0F84. Placing the cursor before the 5 and pressing F2 enters memory edit mode, where we can then type 4 and press F2 to save that change. Immediately, you can see the JNZ line is now JZ. Pressing F8 to reach that line will now reveal the flashing green line. That's right, despite the complexity of the original two-phase authentication process, a single byte change was enough to entirely circumvent it. This holds true for many applications, while others may require additional traversal of the code using a similar approach. With the patch in place, we can reassemble the executable. To do this, first terminate the debugger by pressing Ctrl F2. We can review the binary changes by selecting Edit, Patch Program, Patched Bytes, or pressing Ctrl-Alt-P when in IDA or hex view. This will list the lone byte change we made. Assuming we're all set, go back to IDA view and select Edit, Patch Program, Apply Patches to Input File. The defaults should encapsulate the entire executable, and you can optionally create a backup. Click OK and you should see confirmation that the patch has been applied. 
You should now be able to launch the ordinary Monita executable and see that the trial check is bypassed. Phase 7 Resource Editing A patched executable resolves the foundational problem, but additional polishing and modernizing through general resource editing can enhance the final release. Despite being compiled, typical executables can still be parsed to extract embedded assets and metadata. Common uses for this include upgrading the icon, altering the version number, changing labels, strings, or manipulating window sizes and controls. Let's walk through three such examples. Although IDA supports fundamental resource viewing, a more dedicated free solution for this cause is Resource Hacker. Once installed, you can open up any executable to view an organized hierarchy of editable resources. Icon Creation The Monita icon was never intended for high-resolution displays and is fixed at 32 by 32 pixels. Modern operating systems expect 256 by 256 icons for adequate scaling across all view modes. We can fix this and add an alternative icon set through resource editing. For the icons themselves, I made two variants. One was just the nearest neighbor upscaled version for authenticity. For the other, I grabbed a CC0 public domain cartoon figure off of Pixabay and used the free vector program Inkscape to manipulate it into a more faithful looking modern alternative. You could use GIMP, Krita, or PhotoP.com as other free graphic editors for the image manipulation. Ping images can be fed through ConvertIco.com to generate icon files that pack 16x16 16 16 through 256x256 256 256 variations. Within Resource Hacker, press Ctrl-M or select Add an Image or Other Binary Resource. Select one icon at a time. Since I've added two icons, when I resave the executable and then create a desktop shortcut, both variants will be available to select from the properties. Altering the Typography and Interface Depending on the type of executable, a variety of other personalization options may also be available from within Resource Hacker. Since Monita was developed using Delphi, an expandable group appears to the left called RC Data. Within this group are parameters that make up each of the dialog windows and components. By altering the plain text attributes, it becomes possible to change labels, fonts, positioning, scaling, background foreground colors, and other visual attributes. One example of change would be to update the splash screen to revise the defunct URL. By opening up tsplashform from the RC Data menu, we can see all of the properties that make up the loading screen. I replaced the invalid website URL with my own so that any curious user may stumble upon the patched executable and blog entry to learn about the history behind it rather than a non-existent domain. I also decided to up the version from 2.0.15a to 2.0.16 to reflect the changes and compatibility enhancements I've patched. When done making updates, you can hit the compile button or press F5 and then save or press Ctrl S to rebuild the executable. Be sure to back up and test often when altering such resources as some parameters might be tied to code behind and will crash the executable if changed. Swapping embedded images. There are more advanced resource editing capabilities, but they can get quite complex. As a demonstration, I decided to modernize the splash screen's Monita coin imagery and clip art. The originals were poorly masked, severely aliased, and of a reduced color palette. We can see the raw image data within Resource Hacker. To replace it, I prefer to use the free modern Delphi compatible IDE, Lazarus. I first created the modified images using public domain imagery with scaling to match the originals. They have to be saved as 32-bit bitmaps before being imported into Lazarus to ensure compatibility with Monita. Once added through Lazarus as T images in a dummy application and then compiled, the output picture data from that can be opened in another instance of Resource Hacker and copied over the existing image data within the Monita executable. Adjusting the proportional property to true for each image will also ensure it doesn't get distorted within its confines, which was a problem the original splash screen exhibited. After a few other adjustments, the final splash screen remains faithfully altered. For the sake of historical preservation, I wouldn't recommend altering imagery or other aspects of an original app when patching, but since I'm deeming this version 2.0.16 refresh, I didn't mind making these few alterations as part of illustrating the concept. Phase 8. Creating an installer. The original installer used for Monita is ancient and incompatible with modern operating systems. 
We'll bundle it up using the versatile and free Inno setup and fix database dependency issues along the way. To retain Windows XP compatibility, we will use Inno Setup 5.6.1. Recall from the original audit that Borland Database Engine made up a large part of the installer. This includes dozens of registry entries, control panel additions, and more. Since BDE has been unmaintained for two decades, this is overkill for a single application. Fortunately, many executables, including Monita, will scan their own installation directory for third-party libraries before searching system paths. This allows us to bundle the necessary BDE components within the program folder to create a more self-contained package. To keep this all organized, I created a new installer directory that will contain the installer script, source materials, and final output files, along with any other support materials. Inside of this folder, I created a distribution subfolder and copied all of the necessary application files, including the BDE library components, into it. You should use the vanilla copies of all files other than the deliberately patched or manually altered variants. You can see that I created several resolution copies of the icon graphic and a setup graphic that we can display during the installer. I also copied all of the necessary fonts into a fonts folder and the two new icons into the icons folder. Inno Setup scripts are ordinary text files. Once you've installed Inno Setup, you can launch Inno Setup Compiler and select New to launch a script generation wizard. Or you can open up existing examples or start from scratch. The wizard will ask for basic metadata, path, and file information. This can all be refined in the script itself, but serves as a quick starting point. There are a number of constants that can be used, such as SD to reference the system drive. By default, we will install Monita to the base system drive in a Monita folder to avoid write problems that can occur if using program files and to also ensure consistency among legacy and modern operating systems. From the base generated script, I made a variety of changes and adjustments. The constants defined at the top are then referenced throughout the rest of the script. I converted all absolute paths into relative paths so that the entire installer source folder is portable. The Files section includes all content within the distribution directory and five custom font installations to match the needed fonts if they are not already installed. I set the installer to preserve the custom fonts even on uninstall so that the special Roman glyphs will still be available for use from any application. Finally, we can click Build Compile to save the final executable ready for distribution. Well, almost. Phase 9 Whitelisting the Installer Executable Everything is set for deployment, except malware defenses on modern operating systems can still be a nuisance when launching new or unknown executables. None of this is a deal breaker, and most developers live with it as is, but I'll explore the whitelisting process for Microsoft Smart Screen and third party antivirus suites. Windows ships with Smart Screen and reputation based protection enabled by default. If you attempt to run an executable that isn't part of its trusted database, you'll see a blue pop-up to indicate that the launch has been prevented. The manual way for an end user to bypass this is to click More Info and then Run Anyway. Although it is often assumed that a vendor license has to be purchased in order to get on the Microsoft Smart Screen whitelist, that's incorrect. We can visit the WDSI page on Microsoft's website to submit a file for analysis. To get a developer modified file whitelisted, select Software Developer, then log in using your Microsoft account. Select Microsoft Defender Smart Screen for the scanner, browse for the file, and then mark it as incorrectly detected as malware malicious with a note to describe it. Once submitted, you can track the status online, and if approved, the file will become part of Microsoft's trusted definitions. In my case, this took only a couple of hours to approve, and the executable no longer triggered the Smart Screen prompt. Note that the smart screen is not to be confused with user account control, which will still prompt the user to continue for any unsigned executable if it requires administrative privileges to install. Since Monita requires system level font installation and must support the full spectrum of Windows operating systems, to circumvent this would require signing it using a paid trust certificate, which can cost hundreds of dollars a year and is certainly not something that'd be done for abandonware. Depending on the antivirus software installed, it's also possible that the application will register as a false positive. A quick way to gauge this rate of detection is to upload the file to virustotal.com, which scans it using up to 70 different products. Resolving the outliers becomes a game of whack-a-mole, but is typically similar among all products. After scanning the Monita executable, 
Secure Age was the only product that erroneously flagged it as a generic malware product. I was able to get to their website and upload the file and explanation for analysis, and within a day or two I received notice that they'd whitelisted the file. At some later point when I reran the scan, another contender, McAfee GW Edition, showed up with a false positive. Once again, there was an online form to fill out and submit, with the website indicating it generally takes up to two days to review, but may take longer. These approvals can take even longer to be reflected on VirusTotal.com, and you'll want to make sure you select Reanalyze File when testing the same file at a later date. With all of this done, we've resurrected Monita, and hopefully this guide has served as a logical boilerplate and methodology for patching and cracking lost and forgotten programs in this never-ending quest of preserving the past. If you enjoy this content or has helped you in any way, please like and subscribe to encourage future content. Thank you.